Good evening and welcome to the Pawtucket School Committee on February 14th. I call to order at, at 6.05. Ms. Liss, if you could please take the roll. Ms. Vanello. Here. Mr. Shabna. Here. Ms. Doobie. Here. Ms. Fernandez. Here. Ms. Grant. Here. If you could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we um, begin tonight, I am just going to ask everyone who does go up to the podium and the members, um, if you could just please um, just make sure that you speak into the microphone. Um, it would be appreciated for all to hear. Um, tonight, we're going to start with um, special reports. Um, do we have someone here from Charles E. Shea High School? Hello, everyone. My name is Glenaria Santos, and I will be telling you our Shea happenings. To start off, semester two began on January 27th. We welcomed three new teachers at Shea, music, grade nine science, and a social worker. Guidance has also sponsored the following assemblies during advisory. City year, FAFSA completion, upward bound, prepare our eye, running start, and various colleges and universities. Our winter sports are in full swing in indoor track and basketball. Many of our track members continue to improve on their personal best record. Both of our girls and boys basketball have reached the playoffs. The playoffs start this week. Robotics. Robotics, Mrs. Jones, and the team are extraordinary. On Saturday, the Bucket Bots, Shay's robotics team, was a member of the Winning Alliance for the second Rhode Island FTC robotics qualifier. Along with, the, along with winning the meet, the team also won first place for the control award in second place for the Connect Award, and second place for the Inspire Award. Team members are Luis Diaz, Daniel Santimas, Yaniki Lopez, Benihima Sirleaf, Desiree Roy, and Edwin Guevara Garcia. On Saturday the 21st, Shea's second robotics team, the Raider Bots, won third first tech challenge robotics qualifying meet at Mount St. Charles Academy in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Well, along with winning the meet, the team also won first place for Control Award. Throughout the day, the team negotiated alliances, determined best strategies, displayed gracious professionalism, and dominated the competition, winning 10 out of the 11 matches. Both teams will be advancing to the state completion on March 4th. Congratulations to all team members. On February 2nd, Ms. Du has put together a Chinese New Year celebration with her students that included traditional cooking and competitions. It's officially the year of the bunny according to the lunar calendar. Happy New Year's in... Happy New Year's and the um, <laughs> Happy Chinese New Year. Sorry. This week is a Shea Spirit Week sponsored by the Student Council. Lastly, on behalf of all Shea students and staff, Happy Valentine's Day. Go Raiders! Thank you. Thank you very much. And next we have a representative from William Tolman High School. Is there anyone here from Tolman? All right, maybe not this evening. And do we have a representative from Jacqueline M. Walsh? Thank you. Hi, my name is Princess Afia and I'm a senior video and film major at the Jacqueline M. Walsh School for the Arts. What's been happening at JMW? We had two wonderful performances in January, a theater showcase and our performance ensemble put on a fantastic show called Time After Time. Both were well attended and it was wonderful to have a full theater again. We wrapped up our audition week in mid-January and sent out all of our letters of acceptance. We have commitment letters coming back every day. And we are very excited to welcome the JMW class of 2027. This past week, we had auditions for our spring show, Peter and Wendy, which will go up May 4th and 5th with a special in-school performance for our fourth and fifth grade friends at Agnes Little. We have two of our juniors, Sydney and Katrina, who are serving on the First Works Youth Advisory Board. They have begun meeting to discuss and provide feedback on artists and genres that First Works brings to schools and the community. Studio Playground began their residency in our theater program last week, 
and they have held workshops on clowning and choreographed stage combat. Our juniors had a presentation this week by the College Planning Center, giving advice and information on the college process. This was their second of a three-part series. We are very excited to share that our mock trial team under the direction of Mr. Peter Sloridis has advanced to the Elite Eight and will take on Hendrickin tomorrow in the playoffs. With February break next week, we have a relatively quiet few weeks coming up. We are looking forward to an exciting and busy spring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, um, we are going to, um, we have a couple of people who have signed up for public participation. Um, Maggie Rogers. How's that? I'm Maggie Rogers. Thank you for the time. I will try to be brief. Those of you who know me know that could be a struggle. Those of you who don't know me, um, I am a lifelong resident of Pawtucket. I have been a student, a parent, an educator, and a coach in the city. Most of those hats I keep on a shelf, and I try to leave them there, but I'm here tonight as a constituent. I feel very strongly about public education. Again, those of you who know me, that's not a shocker. Um, I believe it, public education truly is, and particularly now when we live in very, very challenging times, it is the key to the future of our democracy and its survival. I don't think that's an overstatement. So I would like to thank you, and I would like to thank you. I apologize for my back. Everyone who is involved in public education, who does God's work or whoever you pray to, thank you truly from the bottom of my heart because not everything i say is going to resonate with everyone here i've already found that out but i feel strongly that you know the work you do is so vital and i see people that have been at it so long and i am so very grateful so thank you for that okay to my point um as far as the Unified High School is concerned and the Jackie Walsh School for the Arts, Jackie Walsh, by the way, a lovely woman that I knew. So I hate to say anything that might sound negative about the school <laughs> that her name is attached to. And I have nothing negative to say. My concern is that Unified School to me means one thing. It means a city. It means a community. And it seems to me that we Living in the divisive times that we do, I am very concerned about the conversation that I am now hearing about the need to keep the art school separate. Um, and again, my apologies, I haven't been involved. I remember reading about a year ago that there was some feedback from the Jackie Wall students and staff and so forth community. Um, and I even hate to say that because I think we are one community. But I understand that they came and they voiced their concerns about, you know, the possibility that their environment could be lost and that, you know, their programs could suffer if they were rolled into a unified high school. And while I understand that, I still believe that as the adults in the room, it's necessary for us to keep the message focused on community. I was so encouraged last week by the Tolman boys basketball team wearing the one city Pawtucket shirts. You know, as a girl who went to Shea, but my kids went to Tolman, um, that that really gave me such great hope for the for the moment and for the future. And I would like to see that community enriched even more so by bringing all of these students together and to build that community in whatever way, you know, serves them all. But again, public education, the goal is teaching young people to be critical thinkers and creative problem solvers. and when you work in a community, all children are artists. They are all creative. Unless we tell them they're not, if we message one thing, if we preach diversity and then 
practice segregation in our programs, we're being inconsistent. Um, and that's a concern for me. And, and I know some of the other concerns that have been raised, um, I think, it, you know, the JMW environment being warm and welcoming. And again, I don't, I don't doubt it, but you have to audition to be accepted. <laughs> and I think, well, here's a newsflash. Every kid in high school auditions every single day to be accepted. That is the reality of being a high school student. And, you know, I think that if we as the adults, again, as the educators, as the people who do this hard work, if we can message that, you know, first of all, everyone needs to be accepted. That is the community we are in, no matter what building you're in, no matter which facilities are falling apart, what have you, you must accept everyone. And the other message individually we want students to learn is, if you like yourself enough, everyone else will follow. <laughs> and I think, you know, again, these are things that the messages have been different. Sometimes the message is, well, the Walsh students, you know, we don't want them to feel different from the others. They're not different. They're all the same. And no one should allow them or, or encourage them to carry that message. In my mind, it should be, you know, the artistic abilities that you have and the programs that we have built around that do not make you different from high school students everywhere else, particularly in the rest of the community. Um, one of the messages about, I think a student had asked in a previous meeting, please don't close our school, we're the future leaders. And while I don't doubt that, I think they're all future leaders, but if indeed, you know, the message is you are the future leaders, then the hidden message is the others are the future followers. And that's a concern to me. But at the same time, though, if you are going to be the leader, you do need to learn to rub elbows with those that you presume will follow in the future. And so I think, again, all of this to me, and I hope I'm not offending anyone with these comments, but I know it's a common theme that prevails when resources that are limited are not shared equally. Those who have had the lion's share sometimes have a tendency to find a way to make it seem as if they are being vilified or attacked when it's only justice we seek. And justice does mean unity, and it does mean community. I think we're one community, and I would like to see that continued. I'm so excited for the new high school. I'm very excited. I brought, okay, so because you've been so kind and listened so attentively, I did bring a present. I actually brought three presents, but it's the same book. The book is called The Sum of Us, and I'm sure some of you out there already know it, um, by a, a writer called Heather McGee. And the, the subtitle is What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And it's about schools, it's about education, it's about a lot of things, the economy. Um, Pawtucket does have a storied and troubling history with trying to integrate our schools, even though we are a northern city and think of ourselves as not that problem. Um, and I just, I want to keep moving forward. I brought three of these, one for each of the high schools. Now, I think we're maybe in the Walsh Library now. Is that correct? Is this considered the Walsh Library? And I, the last I knew, the Tolman Library had been taken over by the Department of Defense, but maybe that's no longer the case. I'm not sure. And the Shea Library. Oh, Okay, we still have a library. Excellent. And I, the Shea Library, I'm, I'm concerned because I know we're facing a loss of accreditation if we don't get our facilities up and running. So, but there are three books here, and it is my great hope that when that beautiful new high school opens and we're all there together, there will be three copies of this book in that one library. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Um, June Christensen? Uh, members of the school committee, uh, my name is Jane Christensen, and I'm a junior music major at JMW. Um, I'm here tonight on behalf of JMW students to say the magic words, please, and thank you. Um, please is the simple part, as we are asking you tonight to vote to keep JMW as its own separate school. Thank you, however, requires a little bit of explaining. Um, as you haven't voted yet, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm being presumptuous by thanking you in advance. Um, rather, the thank you is for the unique and valuable educational opportunity that you have already provided. Um, you may think that I'm referring to JMW, but I'm not. 
Rather, I'm referring to this, this meeting, the last meeting, the ad hoc meetings, the past year and a half, which I and my fellow students have gained valuable real life experiences in civics and how to advocate for what you believe in, for the opportunity to learn in a world that is often full of negativity, that our time, energy, and voices are being heard by our elected officials and can have an impact. Um, nor I, nor my fellow students, nor any of the 800 people who signed the petition submitted at the last meeting will likely be impacted by tonight's vote. Um, the Unified High School is years away from opening, and by that point, we will be well on our way as college students, artists, or whatever else we choose to do. This fight is not one driven by selfish motive, but rather, and appropriately for the day, by love. Love of our school, appreciation for those who have helped create it, and hope that those too young to speak for themselves will have the same opportunities years from now. So, in parting, please and thank you. I'm a teenage girl, it's Valentine's Day, and I'm at a school committee meeting. Um, if that doesn't demonstrate how much we love our school, I don't know what will. Uh, please vote for JMW to remain an independent school, and thank you for your time. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, the next um, agenda item is old business discussion action items. Remove from table high school to be included in the unified high school, Shea Toman and JMW. We have a motion to remove the, the table for the high schools to be included in the unified school um, made by Erin Duby, seconded by Joanne Bonolo. Please take a roll. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Mr. Shabano. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Ms. Grant. Yes. Um, thank you. On to um, the same um, discussion and action. Um, high schools to be included in the unified high school, Shea, Tillman, and JMW. Um, I'm not sure whose item this was, who brought it forward. Does anyone want to speak on behalf of it? Sure, I'll make a motion then. We, that the unified high school include Shea and Tolman. So we have a motion on the floor for the Unified High School to um, include Shane Tolman. And we have a second um, by Ms. Duby. Is there any discussion? Yes, Ms. Duby. Yes. Um, I just wanna echo what I said at the previous meeting that I do believe in the value of an independent arts high school in our city and i also believe that as we move forward with the design of our unified high school that as we do with all of our schools we are intentional about including art spaces and realizing that although shay and tolman are not designated arts high schools they have vibrant artist communities of students who although they didn't go to an arts high school um thrive in artist communities and we need to ensure that the high school we are building has places that value this so that they can thrive as artists as well as the students who are in our independent arts high school so shabano please thank you madam chair i will just <clears throat> excuse me also echo what i had said at the last meeting while i think there's there's plenty of conversation that should have been had it for whatever reasons it, it wasn't had. And I, I think to keep the JMW community kind of in flux for now more than a year um, wasn't, wasn't fair to them, wasn't fair to the community. And I think at the end of the day, the, the marketing campaign and, and the, the push for this on the ballot was messaged as the, combining of Shea and Tolman. So if, if there's any voter out there who voted based off of that, I, I feel like coming back after the fact and saying, we're going to make it Shea, Tolman, and JMW isn't, uh, isn't something that I would, I would entertain. 
Question items? Um, I just have a couple of things to say. Um, I, at this time, I haven't really decided where I think JMW should be. Um, at this time, I think we are early in the discussion. And when I, when I say that, um, I mean that we haven't even gotten to the point where we've hired an architect to decide the new high school. Um, we're in stage two and um, that particular architect, architect will um, be working on trying to get us approval um, from RIDE. Um, with the architects from for stage two, they are going to be doing um, just an evaluation of, of the district and you know what we have in the district and make some suggestions on um, how different things in the community are going to affect the school district. Um, we just have a new um, train station and things like that. I guess one of my biggest concerns is, is JMW housed in Jenks really an independent high school? You know, could there be talks later on with the particular architect who ends up designing the school that there is a separate entrance, um, that they have their own, you know, wing. Um, I, I just feel that there are so many options that need to be looked into before we make this decision. Because I feel that if we are going to keep JNW independent, the answer isn't to keep them here at Jenks. Um, so, uh, like I said, I think we need to look at the bigger picture, um, and I think with a little help from the um, architects and his team who are going to be submitting um, some information to ride on our behalf, um, I think, you know, we should really wait and um, see what they have to say. You know, the, the high school is still five to six years away. Um, you know, I'll admit I'm old. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be here, you know, when, when some of these decisions are made, but there could be people who are placed in these seats that change our votes, that bring it back to the table. And I think that if we really do look into it the proper way, then maybe if there are other people sitting where we are today, then they might say they did it the right way. Let's keep it how they decided it. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of share, you know, my thoughts on it. Um, you know, no one likes to wait, um, but but like I said, um, the, the, the decision can be changed uh, again at any time. So I just don't want to, me personally, want to mislead anyone or I just think that we should really get some more information and then move forward. Um, is there anyone else who would like to speak or? Okay, so there is a motion on the floor to approve that the Unified High School include just Shay and Toman, made by Ms. Stuby and seconded by, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, made by Mr. Shabano and seconded by Ms. Duby. Um, I would like to call the roll. Ms. Vanolo. Yes. Mr. Shabano. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Yes. Ms. Grant. No. And the vote is passed um, four to one. Okay. So on to new business discussion action items. Um, approval memorandum of agreement MOA for facilities equity two. Ms. Devine. Good evening. Uh, before you, uh, we have um, 
um, an MOA from uh, Rhode Island Department of Education, the School Business Authority, and originally released in October of 2021, the Rhode Island Department of Education had created a new initiative to help the facilities um, equity between Rhode Island students. The pilot year in 2022 was a program that was about $10 million in funding, of which Pawtucket was awarded $4.3 million. In its second year, the program um, has been expanded. As you can see, it was successful in $30 million, but it opened it up to 10 districts from five di districts in the pilot year. And before you, we have um, uh, the MOA for uh, Pawtucket to be awarded two playground projects, one at uh, Cunningham Elementary and one at Curtis Elementary. These two projects are estimated at a gross budget of 2 million 092 uh, and uh, 2 million 092, 1 million, 1 1.2 million and 850,000 respectively. The base housing aid reimbursement for these projects is approximately 82.2025. If these projects meet the 15% MBE requirement, Pawtucket may be eligible for an additional 10% reimbursement. This is different than the pilot program where if, if the district had met the MBE requirement of 15%, it would be 100% funded. So we are going to have a share uh, in, in this even if we do meet the MBE requirement of the contractors. Um, with the total maximum reimbursement um, moving up to 92.2025 or 1,928,876. Cost to the district will be 163,124, assuming that the 15% MBE is met. This project will use some approvals from the $234 million approval that is on record with RIDE right now. In addition, as part of this MOA, it's a little bit different. Uh, we previously had a, um, a lighting retrofit project that is 100% funded. It was a separate project from the first um, uh, project uh, MOA um, on the uh, uh, facilities equity. However, it's similar. It's by the same department. And we previously had um, six, six schools with light retrofitting. And as a second award, they want to retrofit lighting three school locations, Varia, Slater, and Goff. This project, the lighting retrofit, similar and the same as, as the previous project, is 100% funded by the Office of Energy Resources. The district's um, schools that were previously um, the, for light retrofitting were Little, Fallon, Curtis, Cunningham, Jenks, and that was estimated at over a million dollars. Those projects are currently underway. I believe they are still at Jenks. They're at Fallon now. Okay. Um, so anyways, um, I bring this before you, FY23 Facilities Equity Initiative MOA for your approval as recommended. We have a motion on the floor by Ms. Bonolo, seconded by Ms. Duby. Any discussion? Mr. Chabonneau. Uh, just more more a comment than, than anything else. I who does this, Melissa? Is this the governor? Is this the commissioner? Is this Mario? Mario. So this is through it, the school building authority, which Mario oversees that department, the school construction. Um, because um, the first part of the project, the the facilities equity itself, ties to our approvals that we have on record. So we currently have a two hundred and thirty four million dollar approval um, that was part of the. The, rent of the brand new elementary for winters, Baldwin, the previously thought of in, um, renovations for Shea, and then 25 million. So it, it is part of that approval. The lighting retrofit is in conjunction with this um, initiative. However, um, it is 100% funded by the Department of Energy Resources. So, so Mario is running both of those programs. I just, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I think it is a, it's a remarkable program for schools in the state and you know the governor the commissioner mario whomever are putting up serious dollars um reimbursable to us i think you know we're gonna we're gonna do 2.2 million in projects and it's gonna cost us 163,000. so i would uh yeah that's my comment i i, I commend uh ride in the SBA for, for this initiative. Um, any more discussion? 
Ms. List, please take over. Ms. Spinolo? Mr. Shabna? Yeah. Ms. Doobie? Yeah. Ms. Fernandez? Ms. Grant? Yes. Moving on to approval of budget transfers. We have Ms. none this evening. And I apologize that okay. we keep it on there. It, we keep it on there because a lot of times they'll just miss the cutoff. So it's best to just kind of have it regular and then say we can skip them. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I missed um, approval to, oh, let me just ask um, before everyone leaves tonight, if you could just see Miss um, Bonolo in regards to the, no, I'm sorry, not Miss Bonolo, Miss Liss in regards to the MOA. She just needs our signature. Um, approval to award O'Brien and Sons lighting equipment for playground project located at Carbon McCabe. I apologize, Melissa. Okay, perfect. Um, at the November 15th in uh, 2022 and December 8, 2022 school committee work session and regular meeting, respectively, the committee approved to purchase playground equipment from the O'Brien Sons in the amount of 301,534.30. This is to uh, purchase the equipment for the Curvin, um, what we're calling the Everyone's Playground Project. Um, it was originally planned to have the general contractor of the project to purchase and install the lighting, non-lighting post. Since we are still experiencing long lead times, we can purchase now at the MHEC, which is the Massachusetts Higher Education uh, Consortium, uh, to uh, discount and ensure that the lights are delivered in time for the GC to install. The cost for each, um, there are six poles being in order that two have no lights and are for decoration balance, two have two lights on each of the poles and two have one light on each pole. Uh, there was a question uh, regarding, and I had distributed um, through the uh, school committee clerk uh, this afternoon, um, a picture of the, the pole. In the picture that you see, it's a uh, skinny pole and it's part of the equipment structure. Uh, the intention for us is to have three standing poles and then they have a tree emblem at the top and the lights are expected to be cut out. Um, and those lights are, um, I think they're called, hold on, let me get the word, foot, foot candle. So foot candle lighting means that uh, one foot candle lighting will do an area of lights for um, about one square foot. And so manufacturer, it has a range, the lights can range from one uh, foot candle to five foot candles, which is one to five square feet. And they'll be on a timer and we can set it however the committee um, in the district would like them to be set. They're meant to be not, they're dim parking lot lights. They are not the bright lights that you see in Walmart or Stop and Shop. Um, that really light up an area. They're meant to be for security purposes um, and safety purposes. We have a motion by made by Mr. Chabano, seconded by Ms. Bonolo and Ms. Duby. Discussion? Mr. Chabano. Melissa, I appreciate the clarification this afternoon. It, uh, it was nice to be able to see a picture of the polls because <laughs> I couldn't grasp what I was. I was surfing the web for that. Thank you. Um, anything else? Any more discussion? Ms. Liss, please take one. Ms. Bonolo? Yeah. Mr. Shabna? Yeah. Ms. Duby? Yes. Ms. Fernandez? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Thank um, you. Thank you. Um, on to field trips for committee approval. Um, Ms. Ramsey? So we do have a field trip for your consideration this evening. I do see Ms. Chella here. Are you presenting? Would you like to present on this field trip? It is a Shea field trip. Uh, they're requesting an out-of-state field trip. Ms. Chella? Yeah. Very brief. Um, we are the senior class advisors, Kendra Borden and I, at Shea High School. And we would love and we would so appreciate if you would grant us two buses to take the kids on a trip at the end of the school year. As you know, these kids spent their freshman and sophomore years during COVID, distance learning. And for the graduates, we'd like to do something really nice for them. So that's really quickly it. We have a motion on the floor made by Mr. Chabano, seconded by Ms. Manolo. Any discussion? Mr. Chabano? I, I just applaud both of you for the coming in saying, let's get a coach bus or two coach buses. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> Any, uh, Ms. Manolo? And yes, they do deserve it. They do. <laughs> 
Grant, yes, uh, please. just because I didn't say this for the record and for the minutes this evening, I want to go on record as saying this is a out of state field trip asked for by Shea High School to the DreamWorks Water Park in East Rutherford, Connecticut on May 18th, 2023 from seven to six. It's about a hundred students with six chaperones. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion? Ms. List, please call roll. Ms. Vanilla. Yeah. Ms. Mr. Chavano, yeah. Ms. Doobie, yeah. Ms. Fernanda, yeah. Ms. Graham. Yes. Moving on to Fallon Memorial Elementary School review approved design submission to ride. It looks like we have Colliers presenting. Oh, okay. Good and evening. Jensen and Hughes also. Yep. Okay. Oh, good evening. Derek Maloney from Collier's Project Leaders, Senior Project Manager. I'm here standing in tonight for Gianna Deka, who I hope is with her fiance having dinner. And um, so this, we're here to talk about uh, Fallon Elementary School. Uh, and joining me is Faye Cothier from Jensen and Hughes. She's the lead engineer for the project. So just a brief history on the project. I think most of you uh, know the, the history of the life safety action plan or the fire safety action plan. This is another component of it. We had a meeting uh, last week, uh, last month to talk about some other ones. So this is a fire alarm replacement and uh, sprinkler upgrade, or it's adding sprinklers because I think there's some sprinklers at the building now. Um, and that's sort of the scope of the project. It's about $1.1 million right now, according to the cost estimate. And the hope is to get it out to bid as soon as possible so that enough equipment can be ordered uh, prior to the summer. It can be awarded and then equipment can be ordered prior to the summer so we can get a good jump on it. But this is a project that would likely be not unlike Barrier and Curtis, where it will continue into the fall and winter um, to complete. I have a motion on the floor made by Mr. Chavano, seconded by Ms. Bonolo. Any discussion, Ms. Doobie? So I know that um, at previous meetings, we've talked about how we, we, we have this list of these projects and we're moving closer and closer to completion. Is this, does this take Fallon completely? Is this the rest of what we need to do at Fallon or is there still projects left to do to cross off those, that list of items? Um, this should wrap up Fallon. Okay, yep. thank you. There are several other things that are included that I didn't mention. Um, there's, a, there's a pile of architectural items, doors and locks and sealant and smoke tight and ceiling tiles and stuff like that, but yes. Well, that's what I was referring to. I know that yep. you said that like there's like there's some doors and they, yeah. these items that we are just working to get to. And what is the estimated completion of all the projects that we need to get to? Um, they have to be completed by May of 2025. Okay. Um, so the estimated time of completion is around there. Yeah. Any more discussion? I just have a quick question. Um, Derek, so this will be again a summer project, which goes into the fall and winter. So they will then work after the students go home and the staff go home? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. I just wanted and to. We do them at Curtis and Barrier. There's the various after school programs. Okay. So some nights they start different times, and you know Fridays sometimes the after school isn't there, so they come in, you know, at three thirty or right after everybody is gone. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to make sure there would be um, no students in the building. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, please. So thank you for the schematic. Uh, I, I think you probably expected me to comment this evening. Uh, all I would like to do, uh, having overseen both the Curtis and the Varia fire suppression upgrades, I have to urge Colliers and Jensen Hughes and the development uh, people who are working with this to include a very detailed description of the location of the fire box and the, because it became a problem in both Curtis and Varia uh, throughout the project, and I don't want any last minute changes. I think that we need to be very articulate and very purposeful in our deciding and make sure that we have that uh, thoroughly articulated throughout this project. Thank you. Any more discussion? We have a motion on the floor made by 
Mr. Chabano is seconded by Ms. Bonolo, Ms. Duby, Ms. Liss, please call the roll. Ms. Bonolo. Yes. Mr. Chabano. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes. Ms. Fernandez. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. And our last discussion action item is district's need for interpreters. Ms. Fernandez, would you like to speak to that? Last week, um, I'm sorry, last meeting we had two teachers. That was last week, right? We had two teachers who brought up the fact that they have been interpreters for the last, uh, for a long period of time. Um, and I did want to talk about what um, the policies were, what's kind of where it's, where we're, where we're at. Um, I think it was really important that um, we, we hear what they were saying. Um, um, we have a um, motion on the what to, well it's discussion action so just we can just have discussion if do you want to um, step in or have anything to say or so after that was discussed at last school committee meeting obviously we want to be able to provide interpreting services for our students we did contract with an outside agency in the school with the school committee's approval quite some time ago uh, and so some of those services are there and they are available for multiple languages more than what we have in-house beyond spanish and portuguese any of the languages and i think last week i want to say arabic was brought up so even arabic can be used through the translation service that we have contracted with so um i just want to ask um and then Ms. Duby, I'll let you, um, is this something that everyone is aware of even when um, they're doing translating letters? Because I think some of the comments that we had from the teachers were that they received the letters um, through Google um, Translator, and a lot of them have to be redone. So, it, it seems like there's some communication loss. So that would be my takeaway as well. I would take that away that we would need to make sure that everybody understands how to access this information uh, and make sure that they have the ability to access access that information so it is available widespread. So I think that was my takeaway from last school committee meeting, and I do think that we could do a better job at getting that out there. Ms. Dewey? Yes, I was going to reference the forms as well, because I know that, you know, a parent with two kids in the district every year at the beginning of the year, we do get that clutch of forms that needs to be filled out. Um, and so I know that we do have about five to 10 forms that go out every single year and um, ensuring that for, for starters, that those forms are all being accurately translated into the language because we have plenty of lead time. And then Obviously, then there's the ones that go home during the school year. I mean, I, my daughter brought home a, you know, a Valentine's Day, you know, announcement about what was allowed in the school. And so those are more of the what they might have been referring to, where if that teacher goes to the school department and says, I need this translated because I know I have students in my class who speak these languages, what the procedure is for that, I think, is what I think I would like to hear better explained um, as we move forward. But for starters, that clutch of forms that we know we send home every year and are very important to return, um, the free and reduced lunch forms, um, address verifications, things like that. So the first one mm -hmm. comes from the state, the free and reduced lunch. Yeah. So that I don't think we can translate a state form. Melissa. The, um, state in Spanish. But I believe, and don't quote me on this, but I believe that we have access to more languages if they do the online. Correct. That's what I was going. Thank you so much for that. No, that's a, it, it is more available online. And those that clutch of documents that you indicate do go home in Spanish and Portuguese. But I, again, I do think that we could do a better job of being able to access those other languages and create a a system and a procedure uh, for teachers and schools to be able to get those documents translated. Sometimes it, the timing of it, I think it's a time thing. So sometimes like Valentine's Day, they might have just created that last week 
and put it through and then that takes a little time to get it out to an interpreting service but i i think a more clear procedure and access and opportunity for those forms for teachers and schools and administrators alike and these services that we have is this a service that because i remember when we were doing our esser funds mm -hmm. um some of this had come up so is this a temporary or is this something that's instilled within the school district so i Mrs. Rabbit, I know that you were active with the MLL and the special ed department in bringing this to our district. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, it's, it's currently in our SF funding. It is in our SF funding. Correct. Okay, so. But it's proven to be very successful. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think, um, you know, when we did our SF funding, um, I think a lot of us were very clear that um, if if there are things that um, we really need in the district and we need for them to continue, that they really should be items um, that that shouldn't be placed in ESSER because we might not be able to roll them over to the budget. So I, I think we all realize with this being a an urban district um and the uh, i guess i want to say you know the diversity that we have in the district that um you know translations is huge so we do need to make sure that um we are on top of this and that we either you know continue this particular um system or we um look into other vendors that can provide um something on an ongoing basis Ms. Bonolo. When I was speaking, when we went to visit some of our schools, um, Ms. Connie and I were speaking about the translation and where she works, they translate into numerous languages and they do have um, a translation service. So she would like to be involved in that and that may be a resource because they use it significantly. Nothing goes out without a translation into several languages. Mr. Chabonneau? Could I suggest that for the April or May meeting, you come back to us with some options? For the, and for the procedure? For the procedure, Absolutely. and if Melissa, by that time, we can kind of cost out what bringing in another interpreter or two to the district, what impact that would have to our to our budget, and then what the best path forward is. Absolutely. Thank you. Any more discussion? Can I, can sure. Yeah, um, so we have the, the translation services through ESSA, through, the, through an agency, right? So, do, so ESSA, the um, ESSA money, funds it, it yeah. Yep. And so does that, when does that go away? When would we have to, because my question is, if that funding is going to go away, can we use that money to buy something, to use it for something more permanent, right? Because that money, that will go away, right? We won't have that funding for long. I can speak to that. Yes. Does that make, I'm trying I'm to, I, I just want to make sure I understand. So the ESSER funding will end. And we will have to, as a district, make a decision as to whether absorb that cost into our local budget, which based on what Mrs. Rabbit just said and the use and the future very well articulated procedure for access, uh, I think that it's probably going to be something that we will find value in and finding room in our local budget to conti continue with that service. Thank you, Ms. Crimsey. Um, any more discussion? So now we'll move on to discussion items. Um, Ms. Ramsey, um, Winter's update. Sure. I'm happy to bring an update to the community this evening with regard to Winter's. It is a complete team approach this evening. I'd like to ask that Kathy from SLAM, Bill Bryan from Gilbane, uh, Derek, Jared, Holly from Colliers, please approach the podium because we are going to do this together. Derek, you can set up the presentation that we have for you. As everyone is acutely aware, we uh, had a failed or burst heating coil at the Winters Elementary School just about a week ago now. We've done numerous 
report outs on what has happened. The long and the short of it is very specific while Derek is getting ready. Uh, we had water damage in a good number of our classroom spaces at the Winters Elementary School. And the response team from everyone standing at that podium, including our internal team, including John and his crew, Gilbane, Slam, Colliers, everybody rallied around that table and were hands, all hands on deck at the Winters Elementary School to get us to the point where you're going to see some pretty remarkable pictures here this evening. I think they're going to speak specifically to the process. They'll probably answer any questions that you have after the presentation, but it does look so much better than it did last Monday. And I think that I am very happy and confident to say we will be able to deliver a safe, warm school back to the students and staff of Winters Elementary right after vacation. And I would like to thank the Winters community, their parents, the students for hanging tough with us through this because we want to get you back as soon as possible. But thank you for the the work that you've been doing on your Google Classrooms with your teachers. And teachers, thank you for shifting so quickly again to distance learning and making the best of it. So at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Derek, who has a very short presentation. And then we have Bill, Kathy, and Holly who can uh, speak to additional information. So um, this is generally the timeline. Um, so we want to 6 a.m. so we can bring the students to the week. Oh, I'm sorry. So on day one was the day that it was um, the third. And that's when the custodians came in at six o'clock and discovered that there was a leak. Um, the response teams uh, arrived on site on that day. There was uh, some kind of failure in the heating system. And that's being investigated right now. Um, all the bulk water was removed and fans and dehumidification was brought into the building. And obviously the, you know, all the appropriate insurance companies were notified at that time. Day two and three con continued in cleanup and drying, which is the first thing that you do in a disaster response or flood like this is evaluate the circumstances and get the wet material that you can see on the floor out. Uh, days four, brought an industrial hygienist on site. And that person was the person that identified all the wet building materials, instructed all the teams to what, what needed to be removed immediately from the building. Um, damaged furnishings were identified. Um, education recovery plan draft was in place by then. Um, and then the industrial scale dehumidification came in with uh, an on-site generator and two large skid mounted dehumidification units. Um, which were installed on the first and second floors where the damage was the most. And then uh, days five through seven um, was Gilbane in action, uh, removing the wet materials. Um, teachers came in and cataloged all their material, uh, identified all their personal belongings, removed all that from the building. Um, the coil was removed, the, you know, the, the damaged um, item that, was, that caused the leak. Uh, and the education and recovery plan was well underway. So these are just sort of before, I don't want to say before and after, but day one and two, <laughs> and what it looked like this morning. So this was a classroom on the first floor. Um, it looks like the class went home um, because that's what happened. There was mostly water on the exterior wall and on the floor. Um, and then this is what it looked like this morning, which was, you can see the exterior wall has been completely removed. And then they were setting up an industrial containment right there, or industrial scale containment to dehumidify that exterior wall. Um, this is a photograph of the, of the third floor, what they call the commons, which is the sort of wide hallway that has um, some millwork and tea, uh, these things mounted in it um, and you can see what it looked like on the day of um, and that shiny stuff is water on the floor and this is what it looked like this morning um, all the flooring material that's going to remain was protected all the wet material has been taken out and new material is going in as of today 
And this was a, um, an image on the second floor where there are uh, specialty project niches that are built into the building uh, for small groups to congregate and work on things together. And this was um, what it looked like on day one. It's sort of hard to tell by that picture, but there was a lot. This was a very wet area. It was right underneath the area that um, had the failure. And this is what it looked like this morning. And you can see all the all the wet building material has been removed and new material is starting to go back in. And then uh, just the, you know, the sort of the recovery plan is um, 23 rooms in the north wing were totally impacted. Um, expecting three to nine classrooms somewhere in that range to be delivered uh, by the end of next week. And the weeks are starting to blend together today. So excuse me. If I... All but three to nine. All but three to nine. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, the best case scenario would be th there are three that are heavily damaged and they were sort of stacked. Uh, the, the incident occurred on the third floor of the building. Um, and um, hopefully reopening on 227 for everybody. Ms. Spinola. Derek, the replacement of the materials in the learning cubby um, in the hallways. Another. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so there's going to be a two step process to full restoration. The first step is to make all of the spaces usable as teaching and learning environments. Um, certainly restoring all of the walls and floor finishes and so forth but the lead time on certain materials is such that we cannot obtain it in time for the school to be reopened as it needs to be reopened so we will be putting in some temporary um, finishes for instance the carpet material is not available um, the the millwork items that's all custom millwork that was in the uh, common spaces on the third floor and second floor so I will actually, I'm, my intent is to meet with Lisa and Maria tomorrow to determine what they actually need in those areas. And we will go to WB Mason or some other source to find suitable um, temporary furnishings for those spaces. There's some other permanent furnishings that was part of the ff &E package that the school district um, procured independently and they will make those decisions themselves. Um, so you're saying that there's going to be um, lead time on some materials. Is there an anticipation that what we are getting into is we are going to be doing, um, obviously, delivering a safe building for the students to go into, but then we're going to be doing significant summer work in this building? Because I imagine that we were counting on winters as one of our air-conditioned buildings to do summer programming in. Um, is there an anticipation that this building will be heavily in like renovations over the summer now? So I don't want to characterize it as heavy, um, but we certainly had preliminary conversations with Elisa regarding the use of the building during the summer. So let me give you an example. There are, I think in both the second and third floor hallways, there's an area about the size of the area in front of you in this U-shaped area. There's three areas like that that we will have to replace the carpet in. It's not a significant undertaking to do that. Um, for the purpose of expediency today, so the classrooms can be reused, we are having to patch, a, in general, six to 12 inches of wall at the floor line. We are painting that and we are blending it in to the rest of the wall surface, rather than repainting the entire wall. We will have to put together a painting program for the building through the summer. Whether we do that by flooding it with manpower and do it in a week or two weeks, or we stagger it over the course of the summer, I don't know yet. We will work with the school department to determine what's best for them, best for the kids. So I, I'd like to add to, Ms. Doobie's question, yes, we will lose some ability to use winters. We've already gone back to the team with regard to 
changing our plan for summer programming. It's kind of taken a little bit of a back seat to immediate opening, but we will lose some of the opportunity to use winters this summer, but not completely. Because remember, we do have a good portion of the school that is still available to us. And as long as we can safely provide egress and safely work within the scope of what we have, then we'll be able to utilize, maybe not for the three schools that were being housed there, but for fewer schools that are being housed there. Um, Ms. Bonomo and then Mr. Chavez. Okay, so I have a couple questions. First, the um, ground zero, as we call it, the corner classroom, all of those desks and pretty much everything in it was ruined. When will the desk be available for the students? So right now, um, we are looking into procuring desks and or tops. The desks are all metal um, and survived um, by and large. There was a lot of humidity in that room, and that's what caused most of the damage to the furniture. Um, so we're working uh, both angles there, Joanne, and we're also working with the facilities department to identify spare desks within the system um, to get back up and running. But it'll be a combination of either uh, new tops for the desks or new desks total. Okay, so it says there, um, best case scenario, we'd only have three classrooms. Worst case scenario, we'd have nine classrooms that had to be relocated to the cafeteria, to the gym, somewhere else within the building. When do you expect that we will have all our classrooms done? We're still waiting for confirmation on some materials. For instance, ground zero, we need a new heating coil for that room. We're waiting for confirmation on the availability of that. Uh, we need to verify that the school department has sufficient attic stock of the floor tile in that room so that we can redo that floor tile, but we'll have to use temporary tile. So I think towards the end of next week, we will be able to answer that question with more um, definity. Um, I'm not trying to avoid answering it. I just want you to know, I only know what I know, and I'm going to tell you what I know, but I'm not going to try to mislead you either. So the coil that is being tested elsewhere by an independent tester, so all of our classrooms have those coils in them. So we need to guarantee that we are not going to have a blowback on a coil in another classroom. The heat that comes out of that is 185 degrees, and that would be devastating to our students, our staff. Um, are any of the other coils being tested for their structural value? So <clears throat> while the I want to answer this carefully but accurately. The we know what happened, we which was the the coil burst. But what why? Things, right. The question is why. We know why. We know it froze. We don't know how it froze. It's a coil in the middle of the of the classroom above a ceiling that has no direct outside air fed to it. And it's the only coil that froze in the building. It's a very unique situation. That's why forensic engineers are looking at it. That's why design engineers are looking at it. We're looking at the building control systems. I, I will say this, and I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not saying that this is the definitive answer, but I will say that there's no indication that has been found yet that any element of the building systems malfunctioned. So that just adds to the uncertainty of how could this happen? Okay, your turn. Michelle. So I, I, Bill, I appreciate some of the, the background on, on what happened, but as Ms. Bonolo said, what reassurances do we have if each one of those classrooms has a coil 
similar to the one that let go. Yeah, that was the only one that let go this time. But what assurances do we have that the rest of the coils throughout the school aren't going to fail at some point along the way? <laughs> Is there a way to test it, or test them, or, or we just hope? Jay, I think I, I can't answer that question because I'm not a design engineer. I didn't design the building. I think that's a question that the designers would have to answer for you. But the building, I, I can only say, has gone through all of the required commissioning processes, which includes pressure testing of all of the components of the systems and everything passed. That size with that kind of mechanical, there's nothing that indicated to us early on. When do we think that this coil failed? Do we have any idea? We discovered it Monday morning. So we have asked for certain documentation to try and help provide it to the forensic engineer so they can provide an analysis and give us that type of information. I think the speculation is it happened sometime late Saturday, whether it was afternoon or evening, I, I don't know. And with, with all the technology available, our system doesn't alert us that there's a loss of water pressure to the, I, I would assume a, what I saw when I walked through it, it was a significant, I mean, we use the word leak up here. That's a stretch. I mean, you know, so the, the, the new HVAC system didn't recognize that there was a loss of water pressure to that building? Jay, I, I, I'm going to say no, because I'm assuming that if there was such an alarm, it would have notified the school department, facilities group in some fashion. Um, but I will, I'll, I'll also add, I'm not familiar with pressure monitors on these types of systems. I'm not saying it's not done. I'm just not familiar with it. <clears throat> typically, typically what happens with um, freezing types of conditions, you're dealing with rooftop mounted equipment with that contain coils. And that type of equipment has the device called a freeze stat in it. And that is recording temperatures. And when temperatures drop below a certain limit, alarms are sent out on those types of systems. This system doesn't have that, and I can only assume it doesn't have it because it's an internal recirculation system. So, and my last thought to Miss Vanilla, do we know the water coming out of there was 180 degrees? Or we know the temperature of the water coming out of there. I had not heard that it was 180. I don't want to miss misspeak. I do. Our, Coil temperatures weren't at 180 degrees, though. Uh, just one question on something you said. So when you mentioned that the building passed all of the commissioning, that you're referring to before we opened it, am I correct? So in other words, as part of the commissioning of this building, there were water pressure tests, and there, there were tests to make sure that the system was working. So, but... Is that going to, is there a way to do that again at this stage? Um, to, I mean, is that a plan to happen over the next week and a half um, to ensure that everything is still where it, I mean, obviously something still went wrong, even though we did this, but is that a plan? Yes. So we are, again, this is a two-step process. So we are bringing in the um, the controls contractor, mechanical contractor. After we get all of this specialized equipment out of the building that's providing supplemental dehumidification and heating and so forth, we need to get the building returned to normal state, if you will, so that they can go through the building and make sure all of the systems are operating properly. Um, I don't want to get too technical, but there is a a linkage in the control system that involves all of the classrooms on the third floor. So to isolate that one classroom, they've had to modify some programming 
So we just want to make sure that that's all working properly. When the new coil is installed, the system within that classroom will be fully recommissioned. Is there a, an HVAC unit above that classroom that fed into that coil on the roof? There's a central unit that feeds every classroom, not just that one. Is it and, above and that, that classroom? No. And it was that unit was in proper operating conditions, supplying air of the proper temperature. So that unit takes in outside air and it does heat it and temper it. So it's, I don't know the exact temperature, but it's it's common that a unit like that might provide 70 degree return air to a unit. Okay, so my last question is, as of the flood, your company had not turned the services over to the Pawtucket School Department, you hadn't released. Um, John, what is, huh? Okay, so there's been no turnover. So why, when the school is already five months out, hadn't it been turned over to us? There had to be a reason. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to get into a lengthy conversation, but I will tell you that training was scheduled on multiple occasions and on multiple occasions, it had to be rescheduled for reasons that I don't personally know about, but it's, if you care for that information, I'll provide it. To the superintendent and she will get it to us. I would appreciate it. No, I, I just a, a closing thought that I had meant to include earlier. It, you know, while we've had our challenges with winters, for sure, um, but I think it also illustrates why we assembled the team we did to build winters, because we knew it was going to be a challenge going in before we even broke ground. So it's. It's unfortunate, and I know there's a lot of paperwork and documentation to look at going forward. Um, and I, I suspect that we will all be briefed along the way, um, but for the immediate circumstances, I value the partnerships. And I think those are displayed in, in turning around what we we all walked through, a lot of part of last week, to what we saw this, you know, today. So I appreciate that. That was it, Ms. Grant. Thank you. Thank you. Any it, more discussion items? You, Bill, do it, you have something to say, please? Yeah, I'd just like to respond to Jay and say thank you. And uh, to your point, I think the test, so we all know of any relationship, is in, in the good times. It's in the challenging times. And uh, it's not always easy, but, you know, I think that what we always try to do is in those challenging times, exceed expectations. I, I've said that to Lisa. I'm going to tell you everything I know. I'm not going to keep anything from you. I'm not going to try to sell you something that isn't realistic. I would rather tell you the best that we know, and then we'll, we'll all take it from there. And I just want to, um, I was there um, at the building in um, was involved in a couple of the meetings and even though it is a process and it is going to take some time for us to figure out everything out um, I, I think we all realize that the focus is we want to get the children back into the school building um, but like Mr. Chabonneau said um, you know we do we have a great team here um, Bill has been been there every day Holly, Derek, Kathy, John, Lisa, and her team, they really have done a terrific job um, coordinating it and being very patient because as we talked about, it is a process. And 
you know, you can't just snap your fingers and the trust is there or the hygienist is there. You know, these are people that take time to bring in. And um, I think it has been, you know, handled very professionally. And, you know, when this is over, hopefully we can figure out. Um, but like I said, I think our eye is on the prize and the prize is getting the students back in, into the classroom. So thank you for all who have been working early morning to late at night. So thank you. Does anyone else have anything on this subject, Ms. Ramsey? If there's no more construction related questions, I do have something I'd like to say. Sure, please. Any more construction related questions? Okay. Um, I am very pleased to announce that we've been able to work with our community partner, the Boys and Girls Club, to allow for some in-person time for our students. They are partnering with us to bring our students into a voluntarily uh, based, a volunteer situation at their site. First student is working with us to pro provide busing for our students. It'll be a permission slip based opportunity on Thursday for the students to come in. Aramark is working on with us to provide them lunch on the site and they can get some face time with their friends, with their teachers for some additional academics if they want to and for the opportunity to do little running around and playing with their friends at the Boys and Girls Club, which I think is important for these students, uh, their families to see their teachers again and for their teachers to see them again face to face so they know that that things are going to be all right when they come back so that is uh, going to be offered for the students on thursday i'd like to publicly thank the boys and girls club and for a student for working with us as our community partners on that thank you thank you for that um wonderful news miss ramsey does anyone else have anything for discussion okay we will move on to superintendent search committee update. Um, that's actually one of my items. Um, I ask that this item just um, be placed on the agenda for a discussion, just to kind of um, let the committee know where we um, where we stand with this. Um, we are looking to have a nine member committee. Um, this is what um, has been done previously um, and um, with with nine people um, they have um, the district has found um, people who are um, very qualified for the position. Um, most of the um, committee members or future committee members have been reached out to. Um, there are a couple more that I am either waiting to hear from or I am looking to reach out to. My hopes would be by the end of the, um, the month that we would be able to hopefully schedule um, one of our meetings. Um, uh, yes, please. Do we, is, has the chair assigned a chair of the search committee? Actually, I was going to just state that next. So um, um, Chairman Shillel, um has reached out and asked me to chair that committee. Um, the committee that you referenced is made up of whom? Um, they will be made up of, it will be made up of, um, it will be made up of, School committee members. Um, a um, there will be two. Um, a principal from a middle school. Um, the union. Um, what, what, can you slow down, please? Oh, I'm the, sorry. The union. What? A union will have a representative. So a union representative. Okay. Um, someone from the mayor's office. Um, someone will represent from the, is that the middle school? Um, the high school um, and a teacher. And I am looking to see if I can get a director and um, a um, person from the community, whether it be a parent, 
um, or just someone from within the community, and then myself who would chair it. I believe that's nine. Is it nine, Mr. Shabana? I have seven. Seven? Let me see what I have here. So it's two. I have nine. Four. I'll trust Ms. Ms. Okay. Benalo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. So I just I missed that one. Mm -hmm. So um most of the um at this point, you know, nothing has been scheduled. Um I have reached out to um some of the um future members to ask if they would be interested. Um and um most have gotten back to me, the others that haven't, um, and there are a couple that have not been reached out. Did I also say, I, I mentioned union, but did I also mention non-certified union? That non-certified will be on there also. I know, I will just have to go back on my notes here. One, two, three, four, five, Why don't I have, um, I have nine on mine. So, and, and it does include, I'll just have to, I might've just misspoke when I stated it, um, but I do have nine on my list. Ms. Doobie? Um, So I, I do believe, um, and we can check our policy manual, but I believe any subcommittee um, per our subcommittee policy does need to be formed by a vote of the committee. And, um, and we can, once it is completely formed. To, to I, I'm getting uh, legal to nod that, um, so uh, to, we vote on the chair of the committee and also the committee being formed, I believe, per our policy. That is correct. And I can um I can finish um if you're all okay with it, I can finish bringing the um team together and contacting the team, and then we could place it on the next agenda, or it would be your 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 call. Mr. Chavano? I, I wasn't aware of the policy um, provision, but I would I would submit that uh, I don't think you should be forming the team prior to voting on who's going to chair the committee. Okay. I just, I, I think if, if the vote turns out that it's not you elected to chair the committee, but you've already asked nine people, that could be problematic. So let me ask a question. Is it just the superintendent's subcommittee that has to be voted on, or is it all subcommittees? So um, I, I'm, I don't have the policy right in front of me. Um, so just as at the beginning of the year, when we bring our subcommittee list and we say, here are our subcommittees and here are the people chairing them, and then we take the vote on them. Right. And when we established the unified subcommittee, that was a vote of the committee as well. Um, we didn't vote on the unified high school committee. The members? I mean, we could have. The members did not come no. before us. No, we voted, no, we voted on, on a chair. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, no. So no. not all the members. And we. That's what I was yeah. asking. So, like, for instance, and I, like I said, legal can clarify with me, but for instance, for our wellness subcommittee, we do not vote on all of the community members who serve on our wellness subcommittee. We only vote on the school committee members who will sit on that committee. Oh, okay. um, and, and similarly with facilities, we don't vote on all of the individual people who will be on facilities, but we do say who are the school committee members who serve on that committee. That has been our past practice. Um, okay. I'm not sure how much of that, like I said, legal can weigh in how much of that, but I do know we do have language about ad hoc committees in that policy. If I may, ma'am. Sure, please. So, I didn't, I didn't think to look at it in preparation for the meeting, but I did have occasion to look at that section when we were sort of reorganizing again for, and I think you pretty much described it accurately. That's exactly, that's how I recollect it as well. I can bring it up in a second okay. and um, reach out to the, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Like I said, um, I did discuss this with um, um, the chair, Jim, before he did go out um, um, and he did um, approve the agenda. So I assume that everything was just all set. So I would recommend that you stop 
Yes, of course, I will. Yes, at this point until the next meeting it comes before a vote. Of course, yes, and I will reach out and um, just notify um, Jim of that also to let him know for future um, updates. So we will place that on the the March agenda. Any more discussion? We will now move to, and I know we usually kind of take some of these all together. Um, any questions on budget transfers, the overtime report, revenue report, work order summary, and enrollment in suspension expulsion truancy reports? No discussion? Oh, Mr. Chavano. I, I do, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Superintendent Ramsey, how long, are we at a place now where it's it's pushed the button and these reports are printed? Or are we, are these laborious reports that we're churning out here kind of on a monthly basis? I need to uh, defer to Mrs. Devine who churns out these reports on a monthly basis. Any more discussion or all right, if I could entertain a motion to um, go into ex executive session. <laughs> Roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot last time too. the school committee. The school committee may vote to recess to possible executive session in accordance with the provisions Rhode Island general laws. At the request of the acting superintendent pursuant to Rhode Island general laws 42-46-5 discussion of job job performance of the acting superintendent may I entertain roll call vote please it's been hello yeah. Mr. Chavano, yeah. Ms. Doobie, yeah. Ms. Fernandez, yeah. Ms. Grant. Yes, okay. thank you. Ms. Vanola, Mr. Chavano, Ms. Doobie, Ms. Fernandez, Ms. Grant. Yes, please call out the vote. The committee voted with Five members present to seal the executive session minutes and to adjourn the executive session. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Yeah. I closed it too. None of us is smiling. So, um, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> very well Evening. spent evening together. Um, so many amazing things are happening in our schools, and I'd like to uh, give a shout out to our our students and our our staff and our administrators for for just really really keeping everything moving forward. Um, we celebrated a hundred days of school already. Who can even uh, imagine? That and so many of our schools had their little guys 
dress up as 100 year old people. <laughs> it's always so cute. Um, next week is school vacation. I hope everyone has a very ha happy and healthy uh, little bit of time to recuperate and get ready for the uh, remaining summer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have um, I was going to walk on a tangent, but I won't. So I will wish you all a wonderful vacation. I thank you and I thank the future government for stepping up and getting it done. Um, Curly wig. I would like to thank my coach over at. It's Cunningham and Plato and the teachers I met over at Agnes Little. Um, when Connie and I went out and looked at um, facilities, and um, it's going. So thank you. Good night. Good night. You just have to sign our um,